We're going to turn now to a pretty extraordinary story. For the last 59 days, Syrian refugee Hassan Konta has been living in Kuala Lumpur Airport, Terminal 2. Every morning he wakes up on the airport floor and every night he goes to sleep on the same airport floor because he has nowhere else to go. You'll hear from him shortly, but first some background. The 36-year-old moved to the United Arab Emirates in 2006. He says the first few years he lived there legally, working as an insurance marketing manager. Then the Syrian crisis escalated. He had no valid passport and couldn't return home to get one because he'd be expected to enter the military and he feared he'd be arrested if he didn't. He didn't want to. He didn't want to kill or be killed in that conflict. After another few years in the UAE, this time illegally, he was deported to Malaysia this year. On March 7th, he went to board a plane to Ecuador, but the airline wouldn't let him on and Malaysia wouldn't let him back in. Stuck in the airport. He told me via Skype earlier today that his story is representative of that of many Syrians. It's a long story, but uh, the long uh, version of it, it has both, both faces, uh, a, a personal one and general one. Both will lead you to the same conclusion that I am holding a piece of paper, a piece of document, says that I am sorry, uh, I am Syrian. And uh, it seems like uh, most of the world government authorities are judging me because of that. It's not because of my own crime or my own mistakes, but uh, because I am Syrian. Uh, no country is allowing me to, uh, to travel to, uh, as they all require, almost all of them require visa, and there's no way they are giving me a visa. Even the airlines are uh, not allowing me to board. They cancel my ticket at the last minute, Turkish airline. I lost all my money, although all my documents was uh, uh, correct and completed. So uh, it's, it's not only a personal story, it's a, a general story for the Syrian people who are facing since 2011. This type of new racism, it's to be a Syrian or non-Syrian, it's racism, rejected, hated, unwanted, lonely, sadness, death is everywhere. So I'm here paying the price like my other people. There's a hundreds, thousands, millions of Syrians with different stories. That's why I accept my destiny. It's very difficult, yes, to live here, but at least I have uh, an air condition, I have internet, I have uh, a connection to the outside world. There is a people who is living on the camps and the neighborhoods of the uh, countries uh, next to Syria who who's under the weather, the heavy weather, snow, rain, and uh, they have been used. So this is the main tragedy. This is the only tragedy we are facing. We are not a part of this war. We are paying the price because of it, because of others who are in our land. We have nothing to do with it. And uh, we keep paying the price to refuse to be a part of a killing machine and to kill our own brothers, to destroy our own houses. That's it. And as you say, you are entirely emblematic of the Syrian people who find themselves stateless for whatever reason. Refugees who are in camps waiting for a home to go to, people who have lost their homes in Syria. You still have family back there, right? Right. I, the, the, uh, the last time I saw them, it was December 2008. And um, I lost my father in 31-12-2016, uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, I, uh, it's a type of sadness, it will never leave you to know that uh, you failed him, uh, you were not there at the time uh, he needs you the most to support or to stand next to him at the, the time of his sickness. Uh, it's, 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 it's difficult. I, it's, uh, uh, they have their own misery, they have their own tragedy. I'm just their additional worrying now. Uh, for the first 35 days, I did not tell them that I'm stuck at the airport. I thought I will solve it first, then I will tell them that, guys, I was stuck, just like a story, not to make them worry. But uh, they come to know through the media itself. And uh, after uh, five days after that, I could not hear my mother talking. It was just uh, crying, and I was trying to control her, to calm her down. But she's a mother at the end, and uh, she's worrying, yeah. His son, there are people who will take you. You are getting beautiful support from Canada. There is a job waiting for you there. There are people there who will support you. So where are you at trying to get a visa to get into Canada? How is that process going? Yeah, uh, they are a, an amazing group of volunteers, mainly from Canada, some of them from USA, but mainly they are from Canada. Once they hear the story, they approach me. 
they get everything done. They restore my faith in humanity, hmm. and uh, they keep me motive and uh, uh, hopeful. I can at least see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's uh, it's a small light, but it's there. Uh, they get the application, they fill it, they raise the money for it, uh, they get me a, a private sponsor association, they get me an offer job, I have a job there with an official offer letter now uh, waiting for me, and they submit all the documents uh, to the uh, uh, Canadian government. Now it's between uh, uh, the hands of the immigration minister, Mr. Ahmed Hussain. Uh, they have their own procedure, own rules or official channels they need to approach to, to accept it or not. I can understand that. I can respect their priorities. So we are, it's a waiting game. I don't know what the response will be. Maybe they will accept, maybe they will reject it. But I'm still hoping that, uh, yes, they will accept it at the end. But it may take time. So for the time being, I'm here only, yeah. So, so that, so that awful fluoro lights and the and the and the corridor and the passing people and the PA announcements. That's your life. How do you spend your day? What do you do? What do you eat? Where do you sleep? Uh, in general, you will face two types of problems. The main one is how to get yourself out of here. So you start your day uh, contacting people, sending any emails, uh, trying to solve the problem. But uh, the, what takes the most of the time is uh, how to solve the temporary problems to make yourself uh, daily life easier. How to take a shower, when to take a shower, how to clean your clothes, how to dry them. It's, a, it's an airport, there is no privacy. Uh, uh, how, what do you eat? Even a cup of coffee is a bit of a challenge. Every day I need an hour or two hours just to get a cup of coffee in the morning. Uh, because I'm not uh, allowed, I have no exit uh, ex access to the uh, restaurants and coffee shops, so I need to wait for some workers to help me. I give them the money and they go and bring it to me, and it's not easy. So, uh, yes, these types of problems, but I got used to it. Uh, the main issue for me is uh, uh, to speak in general, because I keep reminding myself that whatever I'm facing now, it's okay. I never heard about someone who died because He's sleeping on a chair, so it's okay about the chair and about the uh, shower. Uh, the main thing is uh, unjust feeling, which I, I keep uh, uh, feeling, and uh, hopeless, powerless, and uh, uh, with no future, no secure. I just want a, ble a place where I can be safe, I can work legally. So these basics of things become the, the dream itself. The minimum human rights has become the dream itself. I don't want to be a famous. I don't want to be a quoted like the terminal movie, which people are always quoting. But I just want a safe place where I can establish a family, have a kids, and uh, have a decent work. That's all. Hassan Kontar, who is living uh, such as his life is in Kuala Lumpur Airport.